Now, when we try to find out what part of the brain is doing that, there is one simple way. When we are awake, like we are now, and we are looking at each other from our eyes, where are we, if we want to say, in what part of the brain are we when we look at the world? Simple question. We have two eyes. And the two eyes see two images. Not the same. The two eyes being located where they are, the two images they are seeing are different. But when they combine, they create one image and depth. That is how the 3D movies have been made. They throw on the screen two images and give you special glasses to wear and then the images combine and look like things are very close to you or further away from you. This stereoscopic effect of distance is created because we have the ability to combine two <coughs> images and make them into one. Now, we are not looking through the eyes. Because if we saw through the eyes, we'd be seeing two images. Then where are we looking from? Where do we combine the two? If we merely contemplate on this, we'll find that we combine the two images inside the head. And we combine them at a point that if I were to hold my two fingers like this, that these are my eyeballs and these are the eyes where the two fingers meet, that is inward where we are actually experiencing a single image with distance. It's a very interesting point that we are actually seeing from there and not from the eyes. Eyes are merely carrying two images and from there we are seeing one image. It's a physiological fact. It's a medical fact. And therefore, if we try to say where is that point at which we are seeing, it's easy to demonstrate in a very dramatic way by saying if you draw two lines straight behind the eyes, straight lines behind and draw a line between the ears where the two lines cross the two straight line in the ear it creates sort of a bench. In the middle of the bench is where we combine the two images. Very, very clear. You can test it out. You can Another way of doing it is, if you close your eyes and you can see imagination, imaginary images. You can imagine anything by closing your eyes. Where do you imagine from? Figure it out for yourself. Closing the eyes, where am I imagining from? You'll find it's the same place. It's right in the center of the head. From the point of view of anatomy, it is exactly where the pineal gland and the pituitary body hangs above the medulla oblongata. If you understand the medical science, it is exactly the center, the most protected part of this whole body. With the skull and all the gray matter, everything is protecting that one point. When I was working for the government in India, one of the important person, a VVIP from another country, came to visit us. And he had a car accident and he became unconscious and went into a coma. He was in a coma for a long time. So we were very worried that an important personality from outside has gone into a coma. We called the best doctors from all over the world. We called the best brain surgeons from all over the world. And the, my boss, the chief minister of the state, he asked the doctor, who had performed 1,000 brain surgeries. He asked him, Doctor, where in the brain does a man become conscious from? We are all conscious beings and so many times we are unconscious. Where in the brain is the point where consciousness arises from? And he said, Sir, we have been trying to debate that matter for thousands of years and haven't yet found an answer. All we know as of now is we do not know what consciousness is, but we do know if we put a, a laser beam on the center of the head between the pituitary body and the pineal gland, a man or a woman becomes unconscious. 
So we know that the seat from where you can make a person unconscious is that one single point. But what consciousness is, we don't know. What life is, we still haven't figured out. Because the whole body can be intact when a person dies and everything stops. All the entire physiological system is still intact. Life and consciousness are making everything operate. So we don't have a complete answer. But we do know there is a point in the center of the head where we become conscious from. It's very interesting that these scientific facts and our experiential facts as we can imagine ourselves to be both tally with each other and that is why <coughs> that point which combines the two images of the two eyes from where we see from where we decide to act from where the whole body functions is in the center of the head in the middle of the line that you can draw between the ears and behind these eyes and has often been referred to as the third eye sometimes third eye center it's very interesting that people in spiritual circles are talking of third eye center without knowing where third eye center is that's where we are as a conscious unit in this physical body and we don't have to find it we are there right now if we weren't there we wouldn't be awake and we wouldn't be alive we have to be awake in the physical body and we are already there i get so many emails i am trying to search my third eye center you don't have to search it you are there all you have to do is if you want to experience what will happen to you after the body dies all you have to do is to withdraw your attention to the third eye center what will happen if you were to withdraw your attention to the third eye center what will happen what will happen will be you will concentrate more on what happens during concentration of attention on third eye center and less aware of what is happening outside if you do it with your eyes closed in a quiet room no distraction it becomes easier to put your attention inward on where you already are you see there's an easy method of doing it also a easier method is you can imagine you are sitting in the center of your head you can imagine this body is hollow there's a lot of places there to sit you can have a room set up behind the eyes and furnish it make a nice place and just be conscious there are ears on the sides eyes in front here uh, top of the head just imagine that this is a place where you live that this is not the whole body not yourself it's a covering upon yourself and you have a nice place chosen to live in this body in the head in the center suppose you were to imagine this what would happen then you'll imagine other things too how am i sitting there am i standing or sitting Am I sitting on a chair? Am I sitting on the ground? You can imagine anything you like. Now, when you imagine things happening inside, where is your attention going? To the third eye center. What could be simpler than that? People make meditation so difficult, as if it is some out of the way art to perform meditation. It's the simplest thing that you can do. To imagine you are sitting in the center of the head, and imagine. you have a nice place to be there that is darkness around you is it really dark inside we say when you close our eyes it's dark if it is really dark how could you imagine things there right now you close your eyes completely cover them with black cloth and you can still imagine things and see them after all what kind of light is there that you can imagine and see things inside by completely closing your eyes of course there is light inside a lot of light i had experiment with uh, uh, with some friends of mine in a meditation workshop where i said uh, just like you have a switch to put on these lights outside imagine you have a switch inside and in one of those switches you take it up the light become bright you take it down it becomes dim and you can take it as high as you like when they began to take the light high 
the light inside was brighter than they've ever seen outside. Where does that come from? Can imagination create a light greater than you have seen? Yes, it can. Because imagination is not as imaginary as we think. It's only imaginary because of our conviction that what we see outside is the only reality. If we were willing to accept that there could be more than one reality, then it's not imaginary. But since we believe that outside experience is the only reality, everything else looks imaginary to us. But the fact that you can imagine you are there, can imagine things are happening there, you can sing and dance there, nobody will hear outside. This body is not in action at all. Imaginary exercise. If you do everything inside there for a while, you forget what's happening outside. And then you, amazing things will happen. Depending on how much attention you put inside, depending upon for how long you do it, you will soon say, soon see for yourself <coughs> that you don't know where your hands and feet are. Because the attention is being pulled up somewhere. If you keep on doing it, you won't know where the legs and arms are. If you keep on doing it, you won't even know where the torso is going upwards. Then ultimately, it's going, going upwards. You may be aware of the head, you may be aware of your eyes and face, and you say, where's the rest of my body? Is it floating around? If you hold on longer, you will not know where your body is. But you are there very much. You're doing all the activity that you started with. What has actually happened? You have died while living. Because if you see people dying, and I see so many people terminally ill dying, they first lose the awareness of their hands and feet. They tell, can you put my foot on that side? It's already that side. They're completely unaware. Then they lose their awareness of their arms and legs. Then they lose their awareness of the bottom of the torso upwards. And it's only, they can still speak. When it comes to the throat, they can't speak. They can't tell what they're experiencing. And when it comes up, only when they die in the head, the brain died, they are dead. It's the same process you can achieve by withdrawing attention through imagination and having activity inside behind the eyes to achieve the same result. What happens if you do that and are unaware of the body? You find you are completely aware of yourself. Your sense perceptions at that time are much stronger, much better than you ever had on the physical body. Supposing we have weak eyes, we are using glasses to wear. Do you know you don't need glasses to wear when you are imagining it? If you want to read a newspaper outside, you can't see it clearly. Try to read it inside clearly. You read it with your imagination clearly. How come our imaginary senses are much better? But when you are completely aware, you find all five sense perceptions become stronger and clearer than they ever were on the physical body. It creates a question, it raises a very big question. Are our sense perception functioning in this physical body because of something in the physical body? Or are they operating because in that other self which we have not discovered can be there even when we don't have the awareness of the physical body, that those sense perceptions are creating our sense perception in the physical body? It's an important question. And it can be resolved by a personal experience of that kind. Because you will find that not only are you aware of your power to perceive things through senses, that you will also be aware that you have your whole perception of a, of a body, like a human body, with no weight in it. Do you ever know that when you imagine yourself, say I am imagining that I am walking outside, just imagination. I am sitting here, but I am imagining I am walking outside. Who is walking outside? My imagination is creating myself outside. If we imagine, we are, if I, I ask you to imagine, you are standing with me here. How many of you can actually imagine right now that you are standing next to me? Please tell me. Oh, most of you can do that. It's amazing that you are still conscious of your sitting there, but you have the power to imagine that you are standing here. Who was standing here? Something same like you, because you projected yourself that you are standing here. 
what you just projected you can project completely by becoming unaware of the body and that reality of the physical body will not pull you back and therefore you will discover to your surprise that what you just projected here actually was here and could see touch taste and smell if you want to try that and therefore sense perceptions are independent of the physical body and they are superimposed on the physical body and are functioning as if they belong to the physical body it's a very interesting fact this is not the only interesting fact you can also find that if you were able to withdraw your attention even from that inner body the body of sense perceptions which sometimes we call the astral body or the sensory body the reason why we call it astral body is because astral refers to the sky and a new sky opens up if you were to think of things inside and look at the sky inside with your eyes closed that sky is never a very bright sky and never totally black it's a very interesting sky with a twilight kind of a atmosphere there always there and when you are able to withdraw your attention completely that twilight sky becomes your only real sky and you have no matter no physical atoms or molecules and yet you have the sense perceptions so that kind of a body becomes so light it can fly anywhere in the sky so that experience has been called the astral experience and the body that can do it has been called the astral body it's it's a very interesting experience because if you are there every day for some period of time 2 hours 3 hours a day you spend in that state you'll get more accustomed to it than to the physical body you will know there are two states of being now i am in a physical body now i am in an astral body you will have an experience of both at will when you want to have it it's very interesting that when you are in that state your memory is not the same as the memory in the physical body because here your memory you try to restrict it to what you can remember experience in the physical world you try to remember what happened in the morning and what happened to a physical self you continuously try to use memory to remember these things but some people especially when they undergo hypnotic suggestions to go to very past events they start remembering things not imagining things <coughs> remembering things that happened 100 years ago 200 years ago some people go to some experts who say we can give you past life regression we can show you past lives and people are taken again it's a suggestion it's a strong suggestion and they can take back to start moving backwards and remember things that happened 200 years sometimes 1000 years ago how are you remembering things which never happened in this physical body that means there is something connected with what happened in the past and it's and psychiatrists particularly i have talked to many of them who have had cases psychiatric patients who they try to cure by trying to bring back their childhood memories because this is a belief it's a belief in psychological treatment and psychiatric treatment that many of the small trivial events of childhood are exaggerated so much that they create complexes in us and when we grow up we are having those problems because of those childhood memories we don't want to to live to look at and they are all submerged in our subconscious or unconscious mind and the psychiatrist job or the psychologist job is to bring up those and show how trivial it was and then those complexes disappear it's a very well known system of using psychiatry but now of course psychiatrists are also using more chemicals they think chemical imbalances in the brain are causing all this so let's give some drugs but till recently the method was called the talking out cure that means you talk to the patient about what happened in childhood many of the patients when they bring back yes i was when i was 10 years old this happened i remember when i was 5 years old something happened and they cry and they become emotional and they say when i was yes when i was a grandmother i remember how could a child be a grandmother they start talking of a different life 
So those psychiatrists are surprised because they are trained in a scientific way to believe in empirical evidence of this world, of this life. So they get surprised how you are talking. Just by trying to push your memory back, how can we take your memory back even before your birth? But it does come back. Now, do we have to wonder how it is happening or can we get our own memory back? Now that's very interesting. The mind functions as a physical mind when we are in a physical body and physical awareness. But when we become unaware of the body through practice, not when you go to sleep, that's different. And I can explain the difference between sleeping and having a deliberate practice of becoming unaware of the body. When we become unaware of the body, then the mind functions as an astral mind, not the same way. Because it is now remembering if there are any events that happen to you in your imaginary body. And did it pre-exist? Surprisingly, you will find that our inner body pre-existed the physical body and has come back into the physical body. And people say that this person was reborn. He had a past life and remember some past life events and reborn. The soul has come back. Soul does not go anywhere. Soul never travels. It is the pre-existing astral self that moves because it's a much longer life. The astral self which can be evoked by hypnotic suggestions and by personal practice. I like the personal practice much better than being under the control of somebody else who's trying to create a memory for me. By personal recollection, if you are unaware of the physical body by deliberate action, and then remember things, you can remember things that happened 100 years, 200 years ago, 1000 years ago, in yourself, not somebody else. It's your own same self that you're experiencing in the physical body. It's a very big personal experience, not only of the existence of your own self prior to birth, but also prove to you the existence of an afterlife, because you find that self does not die with the physical self. Why can't we fly wherever we like? Why can't we do this automatically, what I'm talking about? What is holding us here? What is creating reincarnation? What is creating us to come back to this world of physical reality, material reality, again and again? If you examine that point, it's our own desires and attachments. Desires came because we have a mind. We are not the mind. Let me correct that also. We are life. We are consciousness. What makes the mind alive? We are consciousness that makes the mind alive, the sense perceptions alive, and the physical body alive. I'm dividing the self into these parts. The life force or consciousness itself, which I might call the soul, as the human soul. It's immortal, it was never born, never dies, never changes its form, it's the same in everybody, it's the same not only in everybody, it's the same in all living things that grow, it's the same in plants, it's the same in animals, it's the same in angels, it's the same in various entities all over the world, and all over the universe, and all over beyond universes, soul is always the same. Here we are experiencing it as consciousness. We are conscious because we have a soul. We are alive because we have a soul. That soul is not the experiencer through the eyes. It's conscious of experience of the eyes. That soul does not need to speak. It is conscious of having been given a mind, sense perceptions and a body to speak. Is conscious, aware of everything, enjoying everything. Sometimes not enjoying too much, depending upon how we are using the senses, the mind and the body. These are three big covers upon the soul. First cover is the mind. The mind is creating all our experiences. The mind creates an experience which no other 
form of entity can create and that is the experience of time and space. Soul does not need any time and space. Mind needs it. Mind creates and functions only in time and space. Out of time and space it cannot function. Main function we have through mind is thinking. Thinking, reasoning, intellectualizing, rationalizing, logically using and interpreting sense perceptions. They are all the function of the mind. Each of these functions require time and space. Mind can perform no function which is not in time and space. Soul can directly. What are the functions soul can perform that do not need time and space which mind cannot? Most important, love. The experience of love is never time based. It happens com completely spontaneously, no time. Love is experience. Mind thinks about it later. Mind worries about it later. Mind defeats it sometimes later, but not creates it. It's a straight, straight spiritual experience of the spirit. Second experience, which is not mental and directly by the soul, intuitive knowledge, intuition, the sudden gut feeling, you know something, suddenly, no thought. Thinking is something else, gut feeling is something different. Never takes time. Third, experience of beauty, joy and bliss, they come suddenly. This is my master's picture. He taught me all the stuff I am sharing with you. I am really like a parrot, repeating most of the things he said. I see the picture only in single timeless glance. I know the picture. Supposing I begin to analyze it, is it the white pot here? Is it this? I don't see the same thing. Supposing I take this picture out of the frame and cut it into small pieces and make 100 pieces of this picture, put them on my table and start seeing each piece separately, I'll never see the picture. The mind functions by breaking things open. Analysis. Mind's function of realizing anything is through analysis. Soul is synthesis. It sees one. The grand picture once. Mind cannot do that. Big difference between soul and mind. And why am I emphasizing this? Because when I first came to the United States of America, I was surprised that people thought mind and soul are the same. And it took me a lot of pains to explain to them these are different things functioning differently. Mind is a cover upon the soul. It uses the life force, the consciousness of the mind of the soul and becomes alive itself. Mind becomes alive because the soul is in it. No soul, no mind, no nothing to think about. It works together. So the mind, there is also another word for it. Some people don't relate it to that the word is the same as mind. It's called the causal body. That we have covering our soul a causal body. Causal body is the mind. They know the causal body. The mind functions as the causal body. It causes all experiences in time and space. It enables us to have those experiences and it is still a matter of debate. Has an experience to be created by some other agency outside for us to experience or do we create at the same time as we experience? Those who believe that a material world has to exist before we can experience it are called the materialists and they have been arguing the truth about real material things happening for the last several thousand years. Those who say our observation of the things is creating those things are idealists and they have also been debating the same thing. And people have been trying to empirically discuss this matter and the question raised is, is the tree there because we see it? or? We see it because it is there. What is the truth? The seeing of the tree creates the tree or the tree creates the seeing of it? Which is the cause and which is the effect? Many people began to say it's very easy to distinguish between cause and effect. The cause comes first and the effect comes later. Therefore, if you don't bring a tree in front of you, how will you see it? 
but the bringing of a tree is the same experience like a tree the question is the experience you have had outside of bringing of a tree or tree or any other experience is it being generated by some other force outside and you are observing it the observation is creating that experience recently scientists are very baffled they are baffled first because the quantum physics that they came up about 40 50 years ago has created problems that in quantum physics it says that your observation affects what you are being observing that if a wave is there and you observe it it becomes a particle it's a big problem how is the observation changing phenomena outside they are also now bothered that in one experiment the effect came before the cause that they shot a particle a small particle in in fermi lab and particle reached the destination before it left the camera show both it's only one particle of course the same thing that happened long ago when they were trying to put a light through two holes and they would go as a wave both the holes carried the light and they created waves on the other side when you observed them or measured them it became a particle and would only go through one so this is very bothersome that what is happening that in small in very small particles work differently and this quantum physics and quantum mechanics has created a big problem this is bothering them the the other thing they're bothering them again about the function of the mind is what is time space is it illusion or real i have been saying for the last 60 years it's complete illusion and i my definition was very simple that you are experiencing time are you really experiencing or are you experiencing now is anybody experiencing other than now i'm making this question because somebody presented a book to me saying live in the now and i said where else are we living i haven't met a single person in the whole universe who lives in other time than now <laughs> and what is the idea of telling us live in the now and what is now that's the real question what is now is it 1 second or 5 seconds now the before i can say the word was the future the moment i start uttering it became past now has no time at all not in a billionth part of a nanosecond now has no time that we be really living in no time right now that how are we experiencing time if now has no time and we are living only in now then how are we experiencing time well we are experiencing now when i just said it not when i was saying it when i've said it is past so we are calling the recent past as now we are calling the recent past as present a slight mistake not too bad because if it is too far we say past yesterday was past 10 hours ago was past 1 hour ago was past but few seconds is now it's also past is there a real future then if if it is past then must be a meeting point between a future which is holding all events from where they are flowing in and now timeless point they flow into the past is it really true not really and i tell you why supposing you take three verbs out of the all dictionaries of the world the three words being hope fear anticipation supposing we stop doing these three things future will disappear instantly do you know we create the future with these three functions of the mind that the future everything that we are experiencing is being created by these things and all these things require time and in the past therefore what we call future is based upon an experience inside which is also past is past real can anybody experience a past no you can't you can only remember it therefore the only way to access the past is memory we have memory maybe you have nothing else but memory 
Maybe we have been fed with a memory capsule in the brain and it becomes life. Is it true? Is it possible? Can we verify it? Now that's where I come to, yes, you can verify it. It's nothing more than a memory capsule that we have put in our consciousness, which is generating all the experience, mind, body, sense perceptions. Where did we install it? When we had no physical body, when we had no astral or sensory body, but the soul only generated an experience of a mind by conscious, being conscious of it. it. Consciousness means it can be conscious of anything. It's unlimited conscious ability. So when that unconscious ability generated a mind, and the mind was able to generate pre, pre, predetermined capsules of memories, you just picked up one, and it generated a life of astral plane and physical plane. To, do the, to find out if it is really true or not, it's just speculation. Just like I said, the sense perceptions and past life and future life after the physical death can be verified from inside, so can we verify that life is nothing but predetermined memories that we picked up. And there we have to go further than the experiment I mentioned. What's the next step? Same step but not with this body. Same step with the inner body. The inner body has assumed the same shape as this body. Looks like this, slightly bigger for some reason of getting it imposed on this body. But you feel your eyes. If you imagine yourself, you still have feel your eyes, you've got a body and you've got a head. If you withdraw your attention behind the eyes, the third eye center of the inner body, which is exactly at the same location as this one, what happens? You become unaware of your sense perceptions. And then you are aware only of your mind and your consciousness and your soul. When you reach that point, you discover that the whole thing was being arranged by you from there. That the life forms you are experiencing as destinies in this world, they picked up by you. Picked up by you out of his unlimited selection, infinite selection of patterns, permutation, combination of every kind available. And you picked up. You picked up for experiment. Just to have a sort of a dream-like experience pre-prepared in a capsule. You prepare, they call them some DVDs, internal DVDs that you picked up and you're just playing them out. And they're all memories stored. And that's how they're creating a sense of past, present and future right now. This looks like a very simple statement, but you examine them carefully. Examine them at length as you will find that is the truth. That really we are not experiencing time as we think we are. And it is being created because we are reliving memories and reliving of memories. That also creates more complicated issues like is life predetermined? Is, is everything predetermined or do we make our choice now? Do we make a choice or somebody else made it for us? All these questions, ethical questions come up. Are we doing good or bad? Is good and evil real or also made up by us? So many issues come up and they can all be solved. If you are able to have access to your own mind inside, which is possible through introspection, through meditation, to meditate upon your inner self and not on outer self. We all meditate. We are expert meditators, but we meditate on things outside. We meditate on objects, we meditate on people, we meditate on our desires and attachments. We don't meditate on who is meditating. We have forgotten the observer and only notice the observation. We've forgotten the exper experiencer. Only look at the experience. True knowledge comes when you try to find out the experiencer. And you try to find out who is alive, who is having the experiences. And when you discover the self, the experiencer, you automatically withdraw your attention inwards because these covers of mind, senses and physical body, they are covering from within outward. And so when you go within, each layer you go across and go within, you're finding more and more about the experiencer, about your true self. 
that is why they said the ultimate truth is the ultimate true self no difference when you find your ultimate self you find you did not belong to the experience you created you belong to the truth and sometimes it's referred to as a true home how oh, this is not our home too temporary we are here for a very short time it doesn't belong to us but we like it we are attached to it we have got desires for it and some of them are not too good pleasant experiences is a roller coaster here why did we pick up a roller coaster if we picked up our destiny that is a good question that if we ourselves picked up our destiny at the causal plane of the mind couldn't we pick up a better destiny couldn't we have something all good and grand instead of having some highs and lows and having pain and pleasure why not pick up something is all pleasure we could have maybe we did and then we got tired of it if you pick up something which is all good you won't be here not in this world but you would be in some heaven and all the heavens that you can create and enjoy are in the astral plane they are not material heaven is astral it's sensory experience and therefore they are all in the astral plane and you could have picked up that and been in the astral plane knowing everything and then said now what and go back and do something else because you knew everything there it's a great advantage in this physical plane to be ignorant we don't know what's going to happen we think it's uncertain anything can happen we have no idea about predetermination of our life we think we are making choices now we have free will we experience the capacity to make a choice if we have a capacity to make a choice we have to go right or left whenever we like how can it be predetermined we are experiencing right now complete choice and alternatives come into our life all the time either i take this job or not take it i marry this woman or not marry i go on this route or not i follow this path or not if these choices are really coming every day to, in our life and we have to make the choices and we actually make them how can we say it's predetermined we are determining every day what to do but when we determine are we following a pattern that set up in a in a brain to choose only that which is predetermined can we check that out of course you can check that out by going again to the mental level and find not only the events are predetermined the way you will make choices is predetermined and it looks like an experience we are making now because we are ignorant of the future truly said ignorance is bliss blissfully we are ignorant of what the future is and we say we are making choices now and they are not predetermined but you know i was studying in a university and a friend of mine very very diligent friend very studious hard working friend was studying religion comparative religion psychology and all that and one day he called me he said i have found out we have no real free will it only looks like that we have no free will at all i've come to this discovery not conclusion discovery i said come over to my apartment and we'll have a little discussion on free will before he could come i i created a little trick for him i had a tray i put three cups one cup of coffee one cup of tea and one empty cup so when he came in i said would you like to have coffee or tea or nothing i got all three here and you have no free will so don't use it <laughs> you just tell me coffee tea he said you have destroyed all my discovery <laughs> by just putting three cups ahead of me i said i am going to prove to you not only you have free will you have no choice but to use free will you have no choice say i don't want to make a choice that's your choice you say coffee that's your choice tea your choice 
he said, you have stumped me. All my discovery was wrong. And I thought that everything is predetermined and we are just acting naturally according to that. I said, now I'll prove to you the other way. I can be now defending your discovery. But I just defend it scientifically, not metaphysically. I said, when you make a choice, how does your brain, how does your mind function to make a choice? What are the factors that your mind considers? Knowingly or unknowingly? Consciously or unconsciously? What factors does your mind employ to make a choice? It thinks, should I take coffee or tea? I said, there are two sets of factors. One, hereditary, genetic. Your father, grandfather, great-grandfather, they like coffee. So it's coming your genes and you say coffee. You can neither change your father nor your grandfather nor anybody else. Genetic tendency is predetermined completely. The second can be environmental, that you lived among people who developed a taste for coffee and therefore you were having a company of people that created in you a taste for coffee, therefore you said coffee. And whatever environment you have gone to till this moment of choice, they can't be changed. There is no other factor of choice. Have you ever imagined this? That when we choose something, these are the only two factors in our mind, genetic and environmental, that we use, and the brain works through them and says, this is my choice. Looks like it's a free choice because you are unaware of these factors. The moment you become aware of them, there is no choice. These are both are predetermined. This scientific explanation. And therefore, you really have no choice. But you think you have because you don't know what is happening in the brain. You don't know what is guiding you to make a choice. You think you are thinking hard and saying, I should do it or not do it. And all being guided by predetermined factors that are already working in your head. Of course, on the, point, on the metaphysical side, it's all happening because you picked up a destiny, predetermined destiny, in which you had to make this choice. So therefore, both match each other and you really have no choice, it's just an experience of choice. Free will is an actual experience, though there is no real free will. That's the truth. Why was it designed like that? Why has it happened that free will looks real, when it's actually not real? Very good reason for it. The reason is, if we had no free will, we could not seek anything. We could not even seek who we really are. We could not even seek the truth. It's a free will, experience of free will. We don't need real free will for that. We need the experience of free will to be able to seek ourselves. And this whole experience of discovering who you are through deep meditation, meditation going beyond the physical body, going even further beyond the mind at a certain point, which reveals to you your living force, your consciousness. All those are possible because of seeking. If you seek, you will find. It's as simple as that. Therefore, it's such an important factor to have this experience of free will, even when there is no free will. The experience itself generates the experience of finding it out. If everything is predetermined, then this is also predetermined. Seeking is also predetermined. Going back to a true home is also predetermined. But it doesn't look like that because we are ignorant. And we have no idea of what will happen next. That is why everything comes as a surprise. We have created surprise and mystery into our lives to much advantage. Because life would be completely dull and different if there was no surprise and no mystery in it. All these have been created by a simple device of making us ignorant of the future. So that is why true knowledge can come because of our seeking. And when we seek, seek within ourselves, we find who we are within ourselves. The truth has always been lying within ourselves. We can discover everything we want, including all the important questions. Why are we here? Why was this world created? Why did we come and have this experience? What made us have the experience? What is the purpose of life? All these questions we have been asking are all answered by going within your own self, not outside. You don't have to believe anything. 
believe what you experience. There is no scope in real seeking, in real spirituality of blind faith. And I am bringing this message to you that do not go by speculation, by just philosophic ideas, by contemplation of what might be, that you can find out what is. Why look at what might be when you can find what is? And it's all in sight. All you have to do is go within yourself. The deeper you go within yourself, going through these layers of sense perceptions creating as if it is something separate from you. The body creating a sensation, this is you. And there is only life in the body and therefore you are there. And life does not exist before or after. All these can be answered from within yourself. It's not necessary to just speculate on these things. People are speculating for centuries on these things and not trying to really find out what is within themselves. After all, we are conscious because we are conscious in a physical body and we can seek. We have this unique experience of free will only in the physical body of a human being, which is also a very strange, strange exception. Life is there in everything. Life is there in trees, life is there in plants, animals, angels. Angels know everything and no seeking, no free will. We have free will. Therefore, the seeking and free will is the secret of discovering the ultimate truth. And the ultimate truth shows us where we belong. And since we have come to a point that we want to find out the truth, the good way to find out. We spent a lot of time just enjoying what is outside, taking the reality to be only outside and never sought anything else. Which is a good time? Which is the best time to go within and find out who you are? The time when you think outside is not your place. You're fed up. Had enough of it. If you don't feel like that, you don't need to go inside. Time has not come. So long as you're enjoying the show, enjoy. <laughs> and you don't have to. Somebody came to me and said, she was telling us, go within, find the truth and all that. Why should I? I'm having a good time. I have a big house. I've got a lot of money. I'm having a good time. I said, enjoy. It's not your time. Don't even come to me. But he came next week. I said, why have you come now? I am the saddest person in the world. She ditched me and left me. I loved her so much. The emotional pain is so terrible. It can't be solved by a big house, nor with money. There are so many intangible things happening in us and so many tangible things happening. And it's a combination of the two that tells us at some point in time, this is not our place. I think I've had enough of it. If I came for a show in this physical world to see a world of duality, it's time to go back. This world of duality is also created in a very special way. Everything we experience, we experience here, we call it as an opposite. Day, night, sadness, happiness, pleasure, pain. All these are pairs of opposites. Every experience we are having is pairs of opposite. On the, on the side of science, matter, antimatter, electron, proton. Everything is in pairs of opposites. It's a world of duality. Why was the world of duality created? Because if we don't have the opposite experience, we don't appreciate what we have. If somebody has never had unhappiness, he won't experience happiness. It will be just taken for granted. We take things for granted if there is no opposite of it. That uh, Supposing in our true home, there is no opposite. It's non-dual. Where our consciousness exists is non-dual. How do we appreciate it? We appreciate it. There is nothing opposite there. We, we experience and appreciate it because we create a world of duality. It becomes an opposite of the world of non-duality. So even in the world of non-duality can be made an opposite by creating this universe. From a very large perspective, you will see that the whole purpose of this creation, the purpose of creation was to appreciate our own true self, our true home, where we belong. 
So everything has a very good reason and it's perfect. If you look at a picture, it's perfect when I see the whole of it, it's imperfect when I see pieces. The whole grand scheme of things is perfect. But when we see it through the mind's eye, which divides it into space and time, yesterdays and todays and tomorrows, here and there, is imperfect. Anything smaller than the total is imperfect. Total is perfect. So that is why it's great experience that here in the human body, we can have not only experience of different forms in which we exist, of different covers that are on us, but our true self, the immortal soul, and not only the immortal soul, which is also a cover of individuation, the totality that there is only one consciousness in which the whole show is taking place. When I was very young, somebody told me, go on the spiritual path. You know what it is? We belong to an ocean, ocean of consciousness. And we are just a drop which separated from that ocean long ago. We are suffering for a long time. Now work hard on your journey back to the ocean and go and merge in it. And I thought to myself, I was young, but thinking too much. I thought to myself, I am a drop, a beautiful drop. The sun shines on me. I become like a rainbow, different colors. That's what I am as a drop. And what are they telling me? Work hard to go and merge in an ocean. Ocean will not care for one more drop coming in. I will lose everything. What a bad situation. And they're telling me the spiritual path. <coughs> but I was wrong. This is not the truth. The truth is, I have never left the ocean. The truth is, I'm part of the ocean, always. All I left, if you call it left, was to contract my awareness to the size of a drop. And spiritual path is not going anywhere, no journey. Expansion of my awareness to totality and discovering I always was the ocean. Not that I'm going to submerge in an ocean. I was always the ocean and never left it. That's the truth. We have never left our true home. We have only left the awareness of it. And the spiritual path is developing the awareness back of who we really are. It's a wonderful thing. But the signs we have here where we are separating from each other, dividing each other. The mind is a great divider. It divided everything, even divided ourselves from the self. And this division has carried on so long. It's time to reunite ourselves to our true self where we find all that we are seeing here. Not only people, not only objects, but the entire creation is within ourselves, never created outside, and we were always the ocean. That's the truth. I am sharing these things because of the practice of meditation given to me by this man, whose picture you see here. All credit for this information goes to this man. All credit for getting actual experiences by practice goes to this man. Because if I hadn't met this man by, by coincidence, pre-planning, or by setting up the stage for meeting him before I ever came here, which is all we have done, all of us, that we haven't just by accident come to this point that we now want to go back home. This was pre-planned and made into part of our destiny earlier. And that's why when you are here, you come here to get one step forward towards your true home. Even one step forward inward is better than 100 steps outside. We have been taking too many steps outside by scattering our mind in unnecessary attachments. And we call them love. We attach ourselves to people, to things, objects. I love my house. I love my car. I love my friend. I love my spouse. I love my children. I love everybody. How does love? When you say the words, I love somebody. What is your mind saying? I love that person. Who comes first? I or that person? I. Most of the time when we are using the word love, we are expressing an ego trip. I do this for you. And if the other person says, but I don't love you, then I also hate you. That's the kind of love. But when you fall in real love for, with somebody, these words don't come out of you. 
you are too much thinking of the of, of the beloved what you love i goes into background when attachment brings i forward love puts i behind i have not seen any experience greater than love to put our ego in the back bench all others put the ego in front i want to do this i am doing this i am doing meditation i am struggling hard i am on a path is all i all i all ego love changes all that that is why when we say that when we are ready a master appears in our life we don't say we can find one we can find a lot of people who are teachers good teachers they can teach us yoga they can teach us different methods of meditation they can teach us a lot but a perfect living master like the one whose picture i show you here a perfect living master appears in our life when we are ready to go beyond the mind when we want things within the mind other teachers come and teach us how to go there by i you can go to the top of i which is your mind but to go beyond i cannot go is something else what takes us beyond the mind only that which exists beyond the mind struggle effort they are all mental always therefore struggle and effort have never taken anybody beyond the mind what takes us beyond love love pulls us nothing pulls us stronger nothing pulls our attention stronger than experience of love therefore there must be something beyond our mind within ourselves that pulls us beyond the mind a perfect living master is nobody other than a human being who appears in our life and is able to pull us within our own self because he's operating from within our own self by consciousness his awareness is to the total therefore he is part of our own consciousness and he can pull us up and that is why perfect living masters are very few because those seeking the ultimate truth beyond the mind are very few those who seek the true home beyond mind in their life a perfect living master comes by himself we call it coincidence chance by chance accidentally it happened <coughs> there's no accident there's no coincidence it's all the timing of our seeking and our wanting to go back home when such a person comes he doesn't come to teach our mind wants to be taught so temporarily he becomes a teacher he can start teaching like other teachers we gradually find he is not teaching he's pulling us with this unconditional love what's the difference between the love we experience from a man like him and other love the other love is very often conditional upon our responding to something this love is unconditional does not need any response very rare to find such a person human being <coughs> ordinary human being whose love can be experienced as completely non judgmental and non unconditional if you love such a person loves you if you hate that person loves you if you kill that person <coughs> he will love you completely unconditional that's the kind of love you experience from a perfect living master those are rare but they come when our seeking is at that point so that is why these perfect living masters will appear by chance when our own inner self and when we meet them it looks like they are responding to something that is not in our mind but in our soul our mind doubts mind is afraid fear and doubt are created by the mind but such a human being with his love eventually overrides the fear and the doubt of the mind and the love is stronger than the doubts of the mind and eventually even the mind when it starts having an experiences which are good for it begins to love the same human being so it is not ordinary love it's not what we call love it's true love true love is always unconditional it does not lay any it makes us no judgmental we are functioning with our minds and judging all the time we judging people judging situations all the time mind judges soul does not judge <coughs> soul loves soul knows soul has intuitive power to know and the mind keeps on judging 
and that is why it's only when we are seekers of the ultimate truth that we experience that kind of unconditional love from an ordinary human being. Why should such a person be an ordinary human being when the love is extraordinary? It's an ordinary human being because we cannot be friends and love a person who is not an ordinary human being. Supposing a master with superpowers, physical superpowers, were to come in, or say come in from this wall, and he comes through the wall, we'll all be surprised. How did he come through the wall? And he's flying around, and we're all looking up. Who is this guy? There must be some method, some secret way he has come. Maybe there are some wires attached to him. We'll think of those things. Some may be frightened, some may, be, some may even faint to see this event when we are sitting in human bodies. Some may even worship, some may adore. Nobody will love that person. Supposing he falls down here, so many of us will get up and say, please, are you hurt? And we love that person. Love does not come from something extraordinary. In the human life, love comes from a human quality. Human quality has perfections, imperfections, and those are what create a human being. And we really have an experience of love from another human being. That is why these perfect living masters have never claimed they are masters. They claim to be ordinary human beings, living ordinary lives. What distinguishes them is their awareness, that they have total awareness. And, and they can talk to us at the level at which we are. We can talk to them inner stuff, they talk inner stuff. And if we talk worldly stuff, they talk worldly stuff. If we are old, they become old. If we are young, they become young. If we are child, they become like children, no matter what their age. It's such an adaptability to, for them to meet their, the seekers for whom they have come. They have come just to take us back to a true home. And that's their whole object of appearing as human beings. When we are ready, they appear and they take us with their love and take us inward with their love, they take us to a true home with their love, unconditional love, very distinguishing feature, unconditional love. Somebody wrote to me, I have been to many masters and I don't know which one is the right one. Can you guide me? I said, it's very hard for me to say something about your masters, I haven't met them and I am no judge of masters and I never judge, even if I knew them. It's not part of me to judge people or to say who is good and who is bad. So I'm not a very good person to ask this question, but I can suggest to you a little criteria I know, whoever has shown unconditional love to you, follow. Next week he writes to me again, he says, two of them love me unconditionally. Now tell me which one to follow. I said people can't find one in their life. You found two very lucky guy. Follow anyone you like. And you're experiencing that. So he then writes, no, I found out that they are putting conditions on their love. Both of them. I said, I'm sorry to hear that, but you wait. Your perfect living master will come into your life. So these are all predestined things. When the time is right, they happen. And we don't know that because we don't know what is predestined. Though so we set it up, we picked up the capsule of memory. It's our DVD playing up and nobody else has created. Somebody says, I create my own destiny. I said, I agree, but not here. You created it before you were born, <laughs> but you don't know it, you don't remember it. But you can remember it also by going to that part of your mind where your memory is stored. So these are all experiences which are all internal and, and they carry their conviction of a personal experience. People say, ask me, prove to me that these are real. At Harvard University, a great university, I got a chance to study there and the professors of psychology and philosophy, they used to discuss these things with me. Of course, two of the professors were fired from the university for experimenting with drugs. 
at the same time. And I, I, I met them both. Richard Alpert, who was expelled from the university, went to India, became Ram Das, Baba Ram Das, by following Swami there. And the other one, Timothy Leary, also professor of psychology, he was fired and he went into the Pacific Ocean, set up his own ashram, his own church, and called it the Church of the Boo-Hoo, which means he saw no difference in the sublime and the ridiculous. So that is why he named it like that. These, but these professors, when they would come to me, they would say, you know, the mind has a capacity to imagine anything and make up anything. All you are imagining is an astral plane, causal plane, soul. All is being created by imagination in your mind. And it can all be caused by suggestion. It's a hypnotic suggestion. You can also have auto-suggestion. You are suggesting these things to yourself and therefore these experiences are coming. What are you to say to that? And I would say, I agree with you. I am doing a wonderful job of auto-suggestion and finding these things and getting answers to all my questions. And most of all, 24-7 I am feeling happy at this. You people are taking antidepressants, I know it. <laughs> Prosaic and what not. Just because you think too much. You think too much but don't go within where you are thinking from. So we had wonderful arguments on that. I said, if a power of pro-hypnotic suggestion to yourself can give you eternal happiness and can give you the clarity of mind to better your job than you could do before and can give you better, make you better students and better human beings in life, what a wonderful type of auto-suggestion that is. Everybody should learn it. So we used to have fun with the discussions there. But eventually they agreed that it's only going within and discovering the cause of creation, discovering the nature of consciousness, that you can get true happiness. And true happiness comes, it's not happiness, it's a different thing. Because happiness is related to unhappiness. It's an experience of duality. The words used there are bliss, a state of being in which you are totally content, contented and satisfied. A state of being in which you know everything. And that is possible just by seeking for it here. Isn't that remarkable? Greatest miracle available to us on this world. I'm very happy to share all these thoughts with you. They are based on experience, not study of books. I must tell you that also. Of course, I have to give credit to this man for bringing all this to me and telling me the right way to meditate right way to meditate is to discover these things, meditate in your areas of awareness. Before that I tried meditating in the areas of energy, which all lie below the eyes. The areas of awareness lie behind and above the eyes. This whole little small part of our body contains everything you have to find. But below that are centers of energy, the chakras, six chakras, they are energy centers and when you concentrate attention on them, they generate different energy experiences. Some of those energetic experiences can extend like you can feel yourself out of a body. You can have strange experiences, colors and all that. Very similar to the experiences, those professors who have set up a yoga center in, in Cambridge and Boston, those professors were having with the drugs with LSD, DMT and mushrooms, Mexican mushrooms. They were experimenting with that and getting the energetic experiences and I was able to talk to them and tell them their experiences without anything taken. Then they invited me to give a talk, Turning On Without Drugs. That was the title of the talk, I still remember. So I said, these are just energetic experiences and you put your attention on the six centers and the yogis and swamis, I met them they are all practicing it and getting energetic experiences. No expansion of awareness. Just having a strange experience, seeing new colors, seeing expansion of universe, or seeing that you are part of universe. What does it mean? No matter how many experiences you have, it does not give you any idea of the experiencer, which is the self. The truth lies in discovering the self and not the experience, no matter how big the experience is. And that is why I found out that this is the truth I learned from this man. Discover who you are. 
discover who you really are discover what the self is discover the ultimate self the ultimate self is totality of consciousness from where everything is born and can be experienced by any seeker in a human body and that is why i congratulate all of you for having this great opportunity to find the truth while you are still here in the physical body thank you very much for your very patient listening and i am happy to see you and i'll come and see you after lunch break we can go and have a lunch break i'll see you at about 3 o'clock again and uh, answer any questions you may have and there are some people who have asked for a personal one on one conversation i'll be very happy to do that also in the afternoon today i'm here only for this one day stop over but uh, next time i may come for a little longer stay and spend more time with you thank you very much